Hi everyone, hope you guys are all doing well. Just wanted to do a quick video here in response to a video that Silverfish put out this past weekend. And I say quick, a little bit tongue in cheek, because this will probably end up being longer than I intend to make it. But I do think that it's a very important topic. And if you didn't see his video, I'll put a link down in the description below. And I'll also put a link on the actual video here so that you can check it out. But basically, he talked about how to break the cycle of poverty. And he went on to talk a little bit about the trappings of poverty and the generational poverty problem. And then also, too, just he was kind of asking for solutions. And I thought he had some good solutions in relation to breaking financial ignorance and thinking ahead with gold and silver. Those are all things that I try to do and pass on to family and friends. Not always successfully, unfortunately. But I just wanted to kind of add to the discussion and talk a little bit about how monetary policy perpetuates the cycle of poverty. And I think that that's important too because these are all underlying issues that aren't really seen in the mainstream media. And again too, it is important to always look, at least in my mind, the first place I always look is monetary and the uh, monetary policy and the unintended consequences that it has on human action. Now in this video, I basically just want to point out how the monetary policy that we currently have perpetuates the cycle of poverty by encouraging individuals to get more and more into debt. And I think that Silverfish's video is timely, at least in how it relates to the example that I want to use, which is the Canadian household debt to income ratio. And if we look at this Reuters article, uh, in the middle of September, in the last quarter, the ratio of household debt to income in Canada rose to an all-time record of 163.4%. So for every dollar that people earned in income, they had a dollar 63 in debt. And this is an interesting time for this as well, because in the last two consecutive quarters, there had been small de uh, decreases in the debt to income ratio, which had a lot of observers and economists thinking that we were on a path to recovery. And I've actually been following this ratio pretty closely for the last couple of years. If you go back, it was one of the first videos that my brother and I actually uploaded onto this channel, which just talked about how the Bank of Canada policies was perpetuating the increase in the debt to income ratio. So again, too, we're at an all time record high. And let's go ahead and just look at a couple of charts that I want to show to see how monetary policy perpetuates the added indebtedness of Canadians. So right now we're at an all-time high in the ratio and let's go ahead and look at some important charts demonstrating how monetary policy is driving this ratio upwards. And the first chart that I want to take a look at is from the Royal Bank of Canada uh, Economics Research Report that came out in June of 2013. And if we look at the household debt to income ratio, again to in chart number three, again just looking at the chart, we can see that there has been a steep increase since about 2001. And there really are two periods where the debt to income ratio spikes upwards quite significantly. And that's in the period between 2001 and 2006. And then again from 2008 to the present day in 2013. And again, to the importance of this is we have to look at why these particular periods showed such substantial increases. And to do that, we should go look at the interest rate levels from the Bank of Canada. And we notice that pretty much exactly on those dates, in 2001 to 2006, we saw a significant decrease in interest rates all the way through that period. There was a little spike up around 2002 and 2003, but between 2001 to 2006, we saw a significantly lower interest rate from the Bank of Canada. And then of course too, as I'm sure that you're all aware of, since 2008, there was just a, a ridiculous drop in interest rates from about 5% down to about half of a percent and then now at 1% since about 2010. So again, too, we see that at exactly the sharpest increases in the Canadian household debt to income ratio, those are 
coincided with the sharpest decreases in Canadian interest rates. And just going back to this June 2013 report, if we go down to chart 5, we see the household debt service costs. And again, too, the lowest uh, cost of servicing the household debt is exactly in between those periods as well. From 2001 to 2006, there was a sharp decline. And then from 2008 to the present day, there's also another sharp decline in the household debt servicing costs. So looking at all these charts and tying it back into interest rates, it's pretty clear that the artificially lowering of interest rates has the unintended consequence of causing individuals to go further and further into debt. And it should be added that this added indebtedness, it's not as though it's planned. It's more of a natural occurrence where individuals see lower rates and then move towards taking on more and more debt since their debt servicing costs are much lower in relation to their disposable household income. And this cycle can't go on forever, the cycle of them taking on more and more debts when interest rates go lower. And it's my argument that this is where the old adage of debt is slavery or debt is poverty, however you care to use it, uh, that's when it's most true. Since when interest rates rise, and they inevitably will rise in the future, and the debt servicing costs of household rise dramatically, that's when the vacation's over and the standard of living for many people will decrease substantially with it. So it's my argument, and I just wanted to highlight the fact that monetary policy does have an effect on the cycle of poverty, as it drives people into more and more debt. And it's also important to note that these unintended consequences that result from our current monetary policy, they're not easily seen, and they don't really operate as a visible cause of the cycle of poverty. Whereas Silverfish was giving examples where people were frivolously spending their money on cigarettes and alcohol. Again, those are clear examples where people can look at that and see how that could result in poverty. Again, even to the example of financial ignorance as well. But again, to these unintended consequences, they're not really easily seen. And again, they're not visible as a cause to the cycle of poverty. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, if you've made it to this far in the video, I just want to thank you for sitting through it. Uh, if you could like, comment, and subscribe, my brother and I always greatly appreciate that. And I would love to hear your thoughts on the issue. I'd also like to thank Silverfish for putting the question out there. And again, too, I should also mention I'm still waiting for my silver purchase that I made a few weeks ago to show up in the mail. Uh, it shouldn't be too much longer, so when it does get here, I'll hope you guys are looking forward to seeing the results of what I purchased. And it is connected to the, my brother and I's new goal of trying to make at least one ounce, a uh, purchase of one ounce of silver every month. So look forward to that in the future. But that's it for now, guys. Thank you very much for watching this video and sitting through it. Again, I'll see you next video.